Good morning. <clears throat> Glad to see you with us this morning for Sunday school. Uh, we had a, I had a little bit of a problem this morning. I didn't print off my Sunday school lesson, and then I didn't bring the key uh, to Dawn's office to uh, print it out. But where there's a will, there's a way. I got an extension cord out and plugged in my computer. It's maybe not ideal, the computer's kind of in the way, but we will make it work anyway. <clears throat> a couple of prayer requests to mention it, or one rather. Uh, Nancy Goss last night, it was fairly late, maybe midnight or so, uh, was taken to the hospital with trouble breathing, and Jim contacted me uh, this morning, and, or last night, one or the other, and said it is pneumonia, and um, she's going to be treated for that. So pray for Nancy Goss. And uh, certainly if there's any other prayer requests, uh, contact myself, contact Dawn. Um, <clears throat> we're trying to even uh, <clears throat> text them out or email them out. And we're also trying to put them on this, this Facebook page here. Uh, if there's a prayer request, uh, please let us know. We want to be praying for you. And uh, <clears throat> certainly be praying uh, for our nation's leaders, uh, president, and the, the task force, the uh, coronavirus task force. Uh, they're, they're having these press briefings almost daily, having a lot of meetings, uh, just discussing things. And pray for our governor and the state uh, legislature as well, as they're obviously making a lot of different decisions. And uh, pray for our deacons as we make decisions here at the church. We're probably going to have another meeting here uh, in the next uh, week or so once uh, May rolls around. But um, let's just start now that I see more and more people are getting on. Um, <clears throat> let's start with a word of prayer we'll specifically praying for uh, Nancy. Uh, Father God, as we come before you this morning, uh, once again, we are thankful that you are good. Uh, kind, uh, just so incredibly generous with us. We're thankful for your watch care over us every day, right there with us, wherever we go. And we're very thankful that um, you don't give us too much rope, that you're, that you're a good enough God that you take care of us on a daily basis. And Lord, uh, we ask that you continue to do that for Nancy and for Jim and for their family. We pray for Nancy as she's in the hospital there in Lapeer, that she would have excellent care, uh, <clears throat> all the right medications, that there'd be no, uh, nothing that interacts or interferes with each other, and that um, they'd be able to read the tests right, that they do the right tests, give the doctors wisdom as they're, they're trying to help her. Lord, we know others out there are struggling with various health issues as well. Just give them strength and help them stay on the right track that they need to be. And uh, Lord, we know um, that uh, every time we lack wisdom and we ask for it, you are a God that gives it to us. So Lord, in a lot of different areas, really, we need your wisdom and your help. And, and that's what we're praying for today. And Lord, uh, as we have this Sunday school class for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, give us wisdom as we open up your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, <clears throat> I'm using my computer this morning uh, as my notes. So, I'm going to try to... Hopefully this works. But uh, anyway, last Sunday morning we talked about prayer out of Luke uh, 11 and uh, the disciples' prayer and, and whatnot. And one of the big questions we discussed in, in, in the church service was, why pray? Why bother to pray? And that sort of got my mind rolling a little bit. Uh, maybe we need to back that up a, a shade uh, to, uh, is there really a God? You know, why are we talking about praying when we haven't really necessarily established there's a God? And, and this might be one of those videos you might want to share with somebody if it, if it, uh, if it is interesting, I guess. Um, <clears throat> but all over the world, 
people from all times, they've struggled with that question. Is uh, there really a God? Does he really exist? Um, <clears throat> but why? Why do people struggle with that? Well, first, uh, God defies our senses. We can't touch him, we can't see him, we can't smell him, we can't uh, taste him, uh, we can't hear him. You know, he's not talking audibly uh, to us. Uh, but, you know, that's not really a problem for the people that wrote the Bible. That's not a, a problem for the scriptures. Colossians chapter 1 says God is invisible. Uh, but uh, a lot of people still struggle, struggle with that, uh, believing that he exists because he contradicts our senses. A uh, second reason why people struggle with believing in God is because they have certain expectations about God or, or from God. They, they have expectations and he did not meet those expectations. For instance, uh, September 11th, 2001, uh, 2,977 people died in those uh, towers uh, on that morning. And, and the days and weeks and months after that, all those victims' families, they probably had a thought in their mind how they wanted to live their lives. And um, God didn't allow that to happen. You know, they had a certain expectation for uh, what they wanted to do with their loved ones. And all of a sudden that person's taken away, so they get mad at God since he did not meet their expectations. You know, um, sometimes he doesn't do what, he wa what we want him to do. So people struggle with that. They struggle with the existence of God. But I think it's a very important question uh, to consider. Because... Obviously, if you believe in God, that, that affects your eternity, and, and you have to end up taking a step further than that. You have to believe in Jesus Christ, that he died and rose again. You have to ask him to forgive you. That's how ultimately your eternity is determined. Uh, but uh, a lot of people, they, they have to do something. They have to rationalize their existence. Uh, you know, if there's no God, uh, then what are we going to do? Well, there's a bunch of people that I'm going to call naturalists. Uh, these people claim that uh, chance and random uh, existence of things, happenings, uh, explain our why we're here. Uh, to them, there is no God. It all happened because of nature. The most famous naturalist is Charles Darwin. He came up with... Uh, or at least wrote down the scientific theory of evolution. Uh, Richard Dawkins is another very more current uh, famous naturalist. Uh, I think he'd rather be called an atheist, but uh, Dawkins wrote a book called The God Delusion, and he said that one person under a delusion is insane, but if many people are under a delusion, we call it a religion. And so he's, he's just totally writing off God. There is no God. We're all just sort of here by accident, and, and it's all from random uh, natural selection. That's, that's one direction you could go when you're trying to explain our existence, you know, if it's not God. The other direction is to believe in God, to be a theist. Uh, this group of people claim that God was before time and space and matter and energy existed. So God always was and he always will be. And this is uh, the path that the Bible supports. So you can either explain it away by nature or you can say, no, there is, there is a God. That's the two basic uh, ways to go. Uh, let's go a little bit deeper. And point number one, the theist believes in the existence of God because he or she looks around and sees the evidence for intelligent design. They see the complexity of nature and know that there's no way that this all happened by accident. They say the existence of God is just proved by looking around in the world. Genesis chapter 1 is our first introduction to the God of the Bible. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters.
God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good. Uh, so those verses teach that in the beginning, there was nothing. There was nothing except God. That's, that's all there was. And He created everything out of nothing by just speaking. So this would mean that God planned everything, God designed everything. Now the naturalists, the evolutionists, the atheists, they oppose this point of view and they say, yes, yes, there was nothing. The universe started out with nothing. I don't think any scientist disputes that. You know, the, the people that believe in God, there was nothing except God. The evolutionists say there was just nothing. Right? The naturalist says there was nothing. But here's the problem. Nothing influenced nothing, and everything came out of nothing, and randomness and chance sparked life, which evolved in what we are today. I mean, to be honest, there's no real evidence for either, um, you know, creationists and evolutionists. They say, well, it happened so long ago, and no one was there to observe it. You know, the creationist, the God of the Bible, our scriptures, it says, you're going to have to trust me. You know, the same thing with evolutionists. They say, oh, you're going to have to trust me. You know, you're going to have to take it by faith. Now, creationism and the Bible says God, um, this ultimate, infinite, supreme being, came up with everything. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible, again, attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So that verse says, uh, a very simplistic explanation of the verse at least, is when we see trees, when we see the sun, when we look at the complexity of our bodies, you know, just, just something, how do our eyes connect to our brains and, and, and all these different things, uh, all that complexity, we should look around and we should think, boy, there must be a God that did that, that made us. I don't know uh, if everybody was here, I could ask you how many of you have been to Mount Rushmore? I don't know if any of you have been out there. I've never been there. Uh, maybe someday uh, I've seen it in pictures and, and things. But, um, you know, if a, if a child or, or several children, like at our home, if we were to go out there and, and visit um, Mount Rushmore, uh, one of my kids, maybe Charlie, might ask, well, who made that? You know, we would answer, an artist made that. I think it's Borglum or something was his name. Uh, we, might add, we might say, he made that. You know, when people ask the same question about our bodies, uh, who made that? Well, it, it happened by accident. You know, mutations and adaptations over millions and millions of years. That's how, you know, our bodies were made. You know, that would be like saying, uh, 10 million years ago, there was this huge earthquake in South Dakota, and over the years, the, the wind erosion and the water erosion, and, and you know, glaciers moving around, and, and finally, it produced Mount Rushmore, the way we see it today with, with these four presidents' faces. I mean, what are the odds of that, right? Would anyone believe that? No, because it's not plausible, and it's, it's not possible either. You know, no one looks at something like a, a complex aircraft, like a space shuttle or a jet, and thinks, you know what, I think there was a big explosion in a metal factory, and it just randomly, by chance, uh, came together, and now we can fly. You know, Mount Rushmore, a, a complex design, due to the immensity of it, uh, the space shuttle, very complex, our bodies... You know, then we start talking about the four seasons of uh, the earth and the, and the rotation of the earth. None of those things happen randomly. 
You know, it took someone highly, highly intelligent to design and build these things, and, and that's God. You know, people, uh, they look at things man builds and they marvel, but when they look at things God builds, they just give credit to nature in millions and millions of years. You know, and the thing is, the, the things that God builds are so more uh, complex. They're so incredibly complex, much more complex than anything man can build. I mean, the things that God builds are so complex. There's so many things we don't even understand. We don't even get it. You know, so Romans 1.20 uh, would teach us when we look around and we see everything all that does is prove there's a God. Psalm 19. Read a couple verses out of Psalm. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. You might even have that verse memorized. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. You know, some of you might even have a translation that says that, that heavens show God's craftsmanship. That's, that's a newer translation. I like that word, though. I've always liked that word, uh, being a craftsman. You know, God's a craftsman. Psalm 14.1 says this, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know, only a fool would look at the space shuttle. Only a fool would look at Mount Rushmore and say those uh, came about by time and chance and you know, only a fool would look at the universe and, and the complexity of our bodies and the animal kingdom and say, that's all an accident. Uh, Psalm 14, 1, let's look a little bit deeper at the verse. You know, it exposes, if you, if you could turn there, I think it would help. Uh, Psalm 14, 1. When we look at that verse a little bit deeper, it exposes the naturalist or the atheist or the evolutionist real problem. And their real problem, it's, it's a heart problem. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So they don't want a God. They don't want a creator because that would mean that he's in charge. You know, the real reason why so many people around the world, at least in my opinion, uh, why they deny the existence of God, why this, they support the theory of evolution, is because they want to run their own lives. You know, the rejection of God doesn't really have anything to do with the scientific mind or uh, philosophical reasoning. It's, it's a heart issue. They don't want a maker. They don't want a boss. They don't want a judge. They don't want to have any authority above them. They don't want to be held accountable for their actions. So, let's write God off like he never even was. Yet, Psalm 19.1 still says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his craftsmanship. You know, the existence of God, it's, it's very much proven by creation. You know, I drive around a lot, and as I'm driving around, I see different things. And, and, and the longer I live, the more I know that God is real. That God is this incredible, incredible uh, person that, that loves us very, very much. So the existence of God is proved by creation. Number two, it's also proved, at least in my opinion, by human morals. How do people know the difference between good and evil? Maybe you can take a moment to discuss amongst yourselves. How do people know the difference between good and evil? <clears throat> even, even young children. Maybe they're raised not in a Christian home. Maybe it's a very godless home. Even young children raised in a parentless home, maybe in some type of an institution, they know that sharing and being fair is good. They know that stealing and lying and cheating is wrong. Uh, 
that's just basic. People know that. And if there is no God, what rational explanation is there for that knowledge? I mean, where do human beings get their awareness of good and evil if we're all just animals? We've all evolved. You know, in the 1930s and 40s, Hitler was in power in Germany and he had this goal to take over the world and sort of cleanse the earth and establish this pure German race. He wanted to eliminate all undesirables. Um, I think maybe his religious side of it was to push evolution even further. And uh, the majority of the people that Hitler killed were, a lot of them were Jews, maybe six million, uh, starved to death and, and killed. Uh, here's a quiz question uh, for you this morning. I don't know if this will be hard to answer. Every time I talk about quizzes in church, everybody gets paranoid. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you'll know this one, but um, was the Holocaust good or bad? I don't think that's a very hard question, right? Obviously bad, obviously very evil. But Hitler and a bunch of the other Nazis, they thought it was good. Now truthfully, if evolutionists, atheists, naturalists, whatever they want to be called, if they were consistent, they would have to teach that deciding what is good and evil is up to you. Now, I think they are pushing that way at times, um, but they do draw a line, uh, <coughs> several lines. Uh, you can't have it all, okay? Either there is a God, and there is right and wrong, there are such things as morals, or there is no God, and there are no morals. No one's in charge, everything goes, Anything goes, survival of the fittest that they talk about, uh, just like the animal kingdom, let's eliminate the weak, the strong rule, uh, but for some reason we have rules. We know that that's not right. We know that determining good and evil isn't up to the individual person. Someone set a standard, and we believe it was God. Genesis 9 explains, Genesis 9, 6 says, uh, God said, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For the image of God, he made man. That's the explanation right there. We've been made in the image of God. You know, the Bible teaches that humans, uh, nothing else, none of the other animals, nothing else, only people are made in the image of God. Now this possibly means there's a lot of theologians that sort of go back and forth about what this means. It could mean our appearance. We look something like God, uh, although God is a spirit, uh, but it also most certainly means our moral awareness. You know, created in his image means we have his morals. Animals don't have morals. They kill, they do whatever they want. Um, but evolution, if consistent, it should be morally neutral. Like nature. You know, a tree, its roots will grow through your septic field or and through your sewer pipe. and It doesn't know that that's wrong. To, to invade your, your house and, and destroy your plumbing system. You know, nature is morally neutral. It does whatever it wants. But people, we're not neutral. We know right from wrong. You know, there's governments, local governments, national governments that punish evildoers because we're moral creatures. And morality in, in the human world that does not pr promote the survival of the fittest, which is a cornerstone of evolution. In, in the animal kingdom, the weak, the maimed, the deformed, the old, they're pushed out of the herd. They're not allowed to breed because those genes, those characteristics are, are not wanted in future generations. Only the strongest get to breed, and they have to fight for that chance. 
you know, in the human world, we take care of the weak, the, the main, the deformed, the old, and, uh, and that all means, uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, I'm not trying to be crude, that all means that those people have the opportunity to pass along their DNA, even if it means passing along possibly uh, fatal characteristics. Now, what, what's, why is that all allowed? Well, that's all done in the name of love, right? Uh, and that's another moral characteristic that is from God himself, is love. And it's something really only humans share. Uh, first John says, we love because he first loved us. That's, that's why we have these moral uh, part of us. That's why we have love. Humans love. We're moral loving creatures because, because of God loving us first. You know, the naturalist says we're here by accident through this unfathomably long process called evolution. But the Bible says God created everything. And when God looked at it, his creation after he was done, he said that it was good. Now look, look around. Look outside your window. Think about yourself, your, your eyes, your stomach. I mean, our stomachs have to be incredibly complex to digest all the different foods and, and get the nutrients into our bodies that we need. I mean, so incredible. God did that. Psalm 14.1, just to remind us, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know, the naturalist says, you decide what is good, what is bad, yet they're not consistent. They, they don't actually allow that. If they did allow that, you know, uh, different mass shooters would just be allowed to go home. You know, well, that's just what you wanted to do at the time. They, they don't be set free. You know, the Bible says that we know the difference between good and evil because we're created in God's image. Now, when you think about it, did I prove 100% that God exists? I guess not. I mean, I didn't fly around and do any tricks, or God himself didn't part the clouds and, and come through the ceiling and, and come on the video. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't prove 100%, I guess. But, here's the thing, no one can prove that he doesn't exist either. So either view that you take, it has to have faith. You know, the naturalists, the evolutionists, they put their faith in the missing link. They put their faith in time and chance. Uh, the God believers, the theists, they put their faith in this supreme, loving, gracious, intelligent, infinite being. Hebrews 11, 6, pretty famous verse in, in uh, a chapter about faith. It says, it is impossible to please God without faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, him uh, that he can save people. You know, there's no possible way to please God unless you have faith that he exists and then uh, you trust in Christ as your Savior. And that's what it's going to take. And thank you for watching and listening. Uh, this morning, here about 11 o'clock, uh, uh, so we got about 45 minutes. You can go ahead and, and do a few things around the house or you can go back to bed or, or whatever. But we are going to be looking at uh, Luke 11, uh, verses 14 through 28. And <laughs> there was different times in, in the scriptures where it records how Jesus was attacked uh, verbally or tried to be tricked or, or whatnot. Uh, this morning we're going to look at another one of those instances and how Jesus sort of confronted uh, those attackers. It's, a, it's an excellent study. Hopefully I don't get myself in too much trouble this morning. Love to have you back around 11.